Welcome to Bobby Osinski's Inner Circle. Hi, I'm Bobby Osinski, and this is a show all about music, music production, and the music business. I guess today is film and television composer Michael Levine. But first, let's talk about hiring a publicist. Everyone needs a publicist once you get to a certain level. And sometimes people will hire one without thinking, mostly on a recommendation, and they won't ask any questions before they actually employ the publicist. And this isn't good for either the publicist or the artist, band, composer, musician, producer. If you need a publicist, these are the things that you should ask. So the first thing is, how many clients do you have? And this is important because if they have too many clients, they won't be able to spend as much time with you. So you want a moderate client list. You don't want it to be too small, and of course, you don't want it to be too big. If you're the third person on their roster, you may want to think about it. If you get a great rate, it's okay, or if they have a lot of previous experience, then that's probably okay. But on the other hand, it's nice if there's a moderate roster and you feel like you'll get a fair amount of time. The second thing is, where do you think you'll get coverage? In other words, where do you think you'll place a story for me, for my band? So for instance, if you're a metal band and the publicist says that she can get you in just about any other publication except the metal band ones, then it's probably not who you want. Then it's not where you want to go. So for instance, if you really want to get in the LA Times, you want to hear that. If you really want to get in your local music paper, whatever it might be, that's what you want to hear. Another question you might want to ask is, what other artists have you worked with that are at the same level as me? And the reason why is because if they've only worked with artists that are not up to where you are, they may not be able to know where to get coverage or they may not to know how to handle you. Vice versa, if they've only worked with superstars, it doesn't necessarily mean that they can actually do the job that you need because they might always aim too high and not able to get you the coverage you need at your level. So that's important. It's also the same thing if you're a producer, let's say, or a composer where you'd say, what other producers have you worked with? And if they haven't worked with one, then you'll probably think, well, wait a second, maybe this isn't a good fit. The next thing is, how do you send reports? All publicists send reports out. And the reports usually say, this is where we got you coverage. Comes with their bill, most likely. But some actually send it out more often. Might be weekly, might be monthly. You certainly don't want it more than monthly. But you also want to find out who they pitch to. So it's not only who they are successful in getting coverage with, it's who they pitch to as well. And that will tell you if they're really doing their job or not. If they got you two articles and only pitched four people, it doesn't sound like it's the right ratio there. You actually want something higher because usually they'll be pitching a lot of people. And sometimes things don't happen right away. You'll pitch them and there might be another time down the road where that will pay off. So the more, the better, because it usually means you're getting your money's worth. So those are the things you should ask if and when you're going to hire a publicist, because that will make sure that you do get the best fit. If you have any questions or comments, send them to questions at bobbyownercircle.com. Don't forget about my new coaching program. It's 101 Mixing Tricks, big studio tricks for the small studio. And you can go to 101mixingtricks.com to learn more. The next thing I want to talk about is three terabyte drives. Now, of course, our digital lives now run on our hard drives. And all of us have way too many sitting around. And we're always buying more. And we always want something that's really reliable. And even though we have a backup, it's a real pain to have to get another drive and then back it up and wait till everything restores. And then cross your fingers that it's going to come back the way you expect. So we're always looking for a good deal on hard drives. There's a company called Backblaze and they're a backup company. And of course they got tons of hard drives and they recently did a study on the 41,000 drives that they have. And what they found was that the least reliable of all of them were Seagate three terabyte drives. And these were not only a a little less reliable, they were way unreliable at about 40% failure rate. This is over the course of a year. The Western digital ones that they had, the three terabyte drives, were at 8%, which is still way too high for a drive because usually you want it one, two, three percent, somewhere in there. Now, even the Seagate 1.5 terabytes were at around 10%. So if you're going to buy a drive, be really careful about the Seagates out there, you might want to reconsider and get a Hitachi or you might want to get 
a Western Digital, anything other, at least right now, than a Seagate. Now, one of the things that you might want to look at are four terabyte drives, because even from Seagate, they're very reliable, and they're more reliable than anything that has less capacity, believe it or not. Although right now, two terabyte drives are pretty much a bargain. You'll find them everywhere, and they're way less than 100 bucks. So watch out for those hard drives when you buy them. My guest today is Michael Levine, who's a multi-talented composer who's done music for commercials and television and films. Among the projects he's worked on include the iconic Give Me a Break Kit Kat jingle, CBS's Cold Case TV show, and Pieces for the Simpsons movie and Batman Dark Knight. I spoke with Michael from the studio via Skype. Michael, thanks so much for taking the time to be with me today. This is great. Well, anything for the famous Bobby O of Music 4.0 and 5.0 when it comes about. Yeah, sooner or later, huh? Uh, well, sooner thank you. Than we think. <laughs> <laughs> You're too kind. Thank you. Um, I want to go back to the beginning with you. You've had a varied career, and you started out as a violin player, right? So take me to before you were a violin player, to, to when you're starting in music. How did that happen? What, what, how'd you get there? Both my older brother and sister played music, and um, they were taking piano lessons. And I started out in piano lessons when I was four, mostly because I just thought that was something you did. It was the family tradition at that point. Uh, my mom had put all of her uh, deepest desires on my elder, the sister, who's my sister was the eldest of the, the four of us. And um, then to a lesser degree, my older brother, and by the time she got to me, it was sort of like, oh, yeah, okay, fine. You know, and but it was, but as a result, my older brother and I actually ended up being professional my, musicians. My sister ended up, the moment she got to college, changed direction and is now a professional editor and uh, uh, a theater director. Ah. Well, it's still in entertainment. Same thing. You know, same. An artist for sure, but uh, no longer plays uh, uh, the piano. Okay, but then you get into violin. Because w- w- piano was your first instrument, but violin was your main in- instrument for a while? What happened was when I was uh, eight, I went to, I, to a school music program, and I wanted to sign up for playing drums. And um, they were all filled up in the drum program, and the thing they had space for was the in the strings program. And so, of course, drums, violin, when you're eight, you know, hey, <laughs> I guess I thought, well, if they have space there, I'll get more attention or something. I don't know. It was a completely, utterly arbitrary choice, and it's worked out okay, but uh, it, it's not as though I went, wow, I really want to be Heifetz or something when I was eight. I didn't even know who he was. But that being said, that's one of the best training that you can have if you're going to be a composer and if you're going to compose for orchestra. It's really, to be a string player, I think, and to know what the feel is like of a string player is so much different than if you're not and, and trying to um, try and emulate that, trying to cop that when you don't really know what it is. Well, it has its, its own specific language, and I'm really glad. <laughs> for having been exposed to it. I'm also really grateful for having been exposed to rock and roll and playing guitar and all of the other stuff that I've done because uh, string players have so many physical, technical problems that they have to deal with in terms of getting a good tone, playing in in tune, shifting, all these things that are just, uh, that take a huge percentage of your brain. And so what happens is that Things like playing in time get kind of lost in the shuffle, and and a lot, and then certainly playing on changes is like oh, you know, mind blowing, and uh, especially for violinists. I mean, the, the, the violists and the cellists kind of get it a little more because they're used to being in the middle, the bowels of the orchestra. One of the things that I learned, by the way, in terms of what you were driving at, was one of the most valuable things I ever did when I was in college was play viola in an orchestra because I learned so much about orchestration by being in the middle of everything. And the, the first violinists don't learn that. They, they learn what the tune is. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. I see that. Okay. Um, I read a quote from Patrick Mraz about you being the Hendrix of the violin. It was very kind of him. Uh, you got to realize it was at an era in which anybody who took their violin put it through distortion and a wah-wah pedal and delay was the Hendrix of the violin. Um, but 
I I can brag that yes, yeah, Patrick Moraz, who's a little got a little more credibility than some, said it. So th- did that mean that you were playing gigs doing that then? Because that's yeah. way ahead of, of you know people doing that now. Everybody still goes, wow, that's cool, you know. So if you're doing that back then, that's ahead of the curve by a lot. Yeah, it was. I mean, you know, uh, in fact, um, it, you you may or may not know who Alex Cross is. He's a uh, Alex Cross. No, he's a he's a detective. No, uh, who am I thinking of? Uh, Alex Ross, uh, <laughs> uh, who who writes for the New York Times, once panned a piece of mine because it involved distorted electric uh, string players, and he was like, "Well, um, the." Uh, 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 Kronos Quartet has already done that. Now everyone's knocking them off. And I was like, hey, I did it before the Kronos. They knocked me off. Yeah. <laughs> but what the heck. Um, nonetheless, uh, um, yes, I was playing electric violin uh, at, a, at an early age. And uh, I think that I borrowed more from Jeff Beck and Randy California, who a lot of people don't know who he was. He was in a band called Spirit. I, I he played in a very violinistic way, and as did Beck, and um, and I think I borrowed more from them than from Hendrix, who was amazing, but you know, very guitarist. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Okay, so from there, then you decided instead of being a performer, that you would rather be a composer. What was the mindset there? How did that work? Did, did, was that a conscious decision, or is that something that just happened? I don't know if it was a conscious decision. I. Uh, I always viewed the two as being interwoven, and I, I started writing, I don't know when I wrote my first pieces, my, I, I, I think I wrote my first songs when I was about 10, um, and, um, I, and I, I recently found a, a choir piece I wrote when I was 12, um, but so I, I mean I was definitely doing, interested in it then, but in terms of a shift of uh, focus, uh, you know, part of it was reality, uh, that I had a band called no guitars and we went out and we played the whole like downtown circuit and, uh, did a tour and had a video on MTV and ended up completely and utterly broke. And, um, meanwhile I was doing session work as a, uh, for, uh, jingles and was actually making a living doing that. And I was like, okay, well, I think, you know, the universe is trying to tell me something. Hmm. Well, let's go there for a second, because to many musicians and many composers, that's a mysterious universe, the advertising universe, because it's, you know, it, there's not many people, if you're doing anything else, you're not in advertising, it seems. And if you're in advertising, you're usually not doing anything else. So that that's, again, it's kind of separate from everything, from most music that we're, uh, most musicians, actually, and, and composers. How So you started to do that. What was, The way I understand it, the way it works, is uh, you get a an opportunity to write something, and you write it on spec, right? Well, in those days, I did not. Um, I would not write anything unless somebody paid me to do so. Now, that doesn't mean they paid me my full fee. They paid me a demo fee. And uh, because I'm a stuck-up old schooler, I still stick to that rule. I don't write commercials on spec. There are a lot of young people who do. Uh, the nature of the business has changed. Um, but you know, I'll take a, you know, a much smaller demo fee than what it will be if it goes final. And I still will participate in competitions, but it's, um, in those days there were, uh, competitions were primarily, uh, for large campaigns or, uh, for something that involved, had a big vocal contract. Now, now it seems as though just about everything is competitive, but I, I'm, I'm not as involved in advertising as I was back in the day. When, when you were involved in it back then, and when you're first getting into it then, was there a lot of competition? Well, of course, there's always a lot of competition unless, you know, somebody <laughs> invents something. Um, I found a niche because I, I had this weird mixture of interests, which was, um, although I had been started out as a songwriter before I was writing scores and whatever. Um, uh, I, uh, and I had that proclivity to, to write songs. I was playing in bands and so forth. I did have this mixture of being, having played in orchestras 
And then finally, I was really interested in um, just sound design and the whole idea of, of sonic manipulation. I, I got my uh, emulator two was uh, serial number forty. Wow! It's, you know, was that was how? And I've got actually a number of funny stories connected with that particular instrument. But um, it, it because I was so interested in it, I became known in New York as like the guy who did the sampling stuff. Um, in a, a portable way, which was interesting because like uh, the New England digital stuff, the Synclavier actually was ahead of that. And it was in some ways more sophisticated, but it was very physically difficult to bring to dates. And so people, it was kind of a different class of people. And so for p those of us who were sort of session slingers, uh, the emulator too was a huge breakthrough. And, um, I became known as one of the guys who was the guy to call. So that's how I ended up working with Grandmaster Flash, for example. It wasn't because I was such a cool hip, uh, you know, hip hop dude. And it certainly, you know, I, I was the only white guy in the room. But I had the gear and knew how to use it. So they, they needed me. Wow. That's cool. I, I had no idea that you started electronically, basically. Well, in my as a session player, yeah, I was doing more dates as a keyboard player than as a violinist, and, and you know my keyboard chops are perfectly adequate, uh, nothing exceptional, and uh, I, but I would be called in as the synth guy, and so a lot of times they just gave me changes, and I was good at that, and I was good at arranging. It was something that I had a good ear for, and I remember one date where they called me in to play. Um, someone had. Uh, it was it was really just a, a, a rearrangement of a Bach fugue, and I, I came and I said, you know, honestly, um, I can do this, but it's not going to be easy. I have to play it a part at a time. And I did. I had to, and it was a four part fugue. I had to do four passes because I, I didn't have the chops to to sight read a Bach fugue, and so um, uh, and oddly enough, they kept hiring me after that. Can't beat that. Wow. So, okay, when you're doing, how long do you have then when a campaign, a call for a campaign goes out? How long do you have to come up with a demo? It really depends. Um, but typically very short turnarounds, uh, you know, a couple of days is typical, uh, a week sometimes if you're fortunate. Um, now, when I was scoring Cold Case uh, for uh, uh, Jerry Bruckheimer for CBS, we would always start out with two weeks to deliver the whole show. And by the end of the season, it was always like four days. So it was yeah. sort of doing all my jingle work had, you know, turned out to be good, except that in good training, except that I had to deliver a lot more music for Cold Case. <laughs> I did uh, engineering for jingles for, I don't know, six months or something like that. And I loved it because it was pressure packed. And you basically, it, it, in a three hour session, the first session was tracking, a, section, a second hour was overdubs, and the third hour is mixing, and then it was done. And it was great. I loved it. Well, the, the people who do it well have spectacular technical skills. And, and one of the things that I am grateful for, for that um, experience, was that. Uh, I would do an orchestra date one date. I'd do a rock and roll date the next. I'd do an EDM. Well, they didn't call it that in those days. A dance music date the next. Um, and I also, the other thing is, is I have always loved singing. And I got to work with lots of great singers. Mm -hmm. uh, that has really changed for a variety of reasons. And it is much less common now to have um, singing in commercials than it was, uh, you know, in the late 80s, which is when I started out. Well, why? Why did it change? Well, um, initially, the pressure was entirely economic. Um, the singers were, contracts were filed under um, uh, SAG contracts or, or uh, after, depending upon whether it was uh, television or, or uh, radio. But uh, in, uh, I made, for example, I wrote the Kit Kat Gimme a Break jingle, mm -hmm. a very well-known jingle. I made more as a singer than I did as a composer or an arranger on it. Uh, and that was the way that the, the uh, residuals were structured because they were kind of from a different era and it was a bit of a windfall for the, the singers. And then the agencies and the clients got very tight fisted about it and went, well, we don't need singing on this. You know? and, and interestingly enough, it kind of paralleled 
a decline in the idea of using jingles as a way to sell products. Now, I, I think that was kind of foolish in the long run, which is because um, you know jingles got to be known as old fashioned and old school and all this, which is they are. But um, on the other hand, there are jingles from my youth, like. Uh, and E S T L E S Nestle's makes the very best chocolate. I don't know who, who wrote that. I probably should, but um, that has not been in the air in forty years, and yet I still remember it. It's still an effective selling tool. So I think it's it's a tool that will come back at some point. I don't know when and in what shape, yeah. but is, is that the the earworminess of jingles is um, indisputable. Okay, so you're in New York and you're doing jingles, and then you decided to come to California. I, I continued to do other dates. I mean, I during that same time I played on dates for played a violin solo on a Marianne Faithful record. I'm very proud of, and oh, I, yeah. Mike Mantler and Carla Blay on avant garde jazz stuff, and I played, uh, you know, and, and and some, you know, depending upon who the who called me. Uh, it was, uh, you know, I had different roles. I was a string contractor. I just, you know, it was whatever you do, whatever you can to survive. Yeah, sure. Well, how did you make it out to California then? (laughs) Well, I made it out to California because I was getting kind of, well, how can I put this kind of bored with the same job? It was the, the, uh, the nature of the, of writing music for advertising was that it was always very short and I wanted to have a bigger canvas. And I said, well, film and, and television, I, I understand storytelling and, you know, let me take these skills and put them someplace else. And, um, so I moved in 1999, I moved from New York to Los Angeles and I didn't give up doing advertising. In fact, um, for I think eight years I did up until recently, I did the, um, uh, uh Mucinex, uh, Mr. Mucus commercials. Uh, and, uh, I, I'm, I'm proud to say that I've written the music for a, a giant talking ball of snot. Uh, you know, you have to have a sense of humor about this. If you take it a little too seriously, one of the, the drawbacks with the advertising world is the people who are veterans. Um, there is a small number who just love advertising and they love it and that's great. But most of them are people who started out wanting to be something else and get are caught in what my friend uh, Jake Holmes referred to as the velvet trap. Mm. They get used to the, the, the relatively dependable aspect of the uh, income and then, and then at a certain point discover it's too late to change. And so 15 years ago, I went 16. Now I, I went, okay, uh, I want to change because I don't want to be in that velvet trap. You saw it coming then before it really hit you or did it? Well, it was a place in my life. I mean, it, business was changing as well and I wasn't happy with the direction it was going in, but, um, it, because it was becoming much more music by the pound and much less custom music. But, uh, uh, in terms of my own personal goals, that really was more of what I was talking about rather than specifically uh, the business. Um, I just wanted to do other things. I, I, I've always been interested in art music. I was doing, a, I wrote a, a concerto for pedal steel guitar and orchestra. I wrote a piece uh, just before I left New York, a piece for uh, uh, musical saw and a string orchestra where they were, it was divided in two and half of it was tuned to standard tuning the other half a quarter step sharp and so that i had could have quarter tones and um and quarter tone clusters which is a really cool sound wow and um and i had a wonderful musical saw player a guy named dale stuckenbrook who is it remains one of the best in the world um he's got perfect pitch and he's got just you know he very finely tuned perfect pitch and beautiful sound and then as a result of writing that, I got to be friendly with David Weiss, um, who there's, there's two well-known David Weisses. One is a New York wind player uh, who's also, I also worked with, but this was David Weiss from uh, Los Angeles, who was the principal oboist of the Los Angeles Phil for 30 years, but also played musical saw very, very well. And so he got very, he was my first friend in Los Angeles and introduced me to all of the uh, the, the classical folk, because that was um, his world and uh, a wonderful musician. Sadly, passed away last year. When you first came to LA, did you do a lot of session work as a, a violin player? 
Not a lot. I've, I've always done some. I, there are certain people who call me um, on a sort of semi-regular basis. Um, I did a lot of work for Hans Zimmer when I was, actually even before I was in-house, but for five years I had a studio in, in his complex in Santa Monica, and I was yeah, available. So, um, And plus I, I did, you know, I was kind of, you know, had a composer head. Uh, for example, in... Um, Batman Dark Knight, uh, whenever you, you're about to see the Joker, you hear this sort of tick, 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 pitched ticking sound. Well, that's me bouncing uh, a pencil on the D string of my violin and, uh, and then going through all sorts of uh, yeah, electronic processing. But that, that sound um, uh, became a signature for, for that character. And so uh, I did play a fair amount, but I was already working as a composer. Mm-hmm. What was your first gig as a composer then? In LA? Yeah. Uh, I was writing songs for Walker, Texas Ranger. Ah, okay. Uh, my friend, uh, Chris Stone, uh, introduced me to that. Uh, he was the, one of the, there were two series composers for that show. And, and he, he turned me on to the gig, and a uh, great musician. Uh, I'm, he then got really interested in software developing, and I don't think it worked out that well for him, uh, which is too bad, because uh, uh, he was, uh, you know, music world's loss. Would you prefer doing television rather than film, or vice versa? I love doing both. Um, I've, the only large films that I've worked on have been as an adjunct for Hans, or I worked for uh, Cliff Martinez and uh, Harry Gregson Williams um, as additional music arranger guy. Um, and I love doing that, but uh, I would love it more if they were my films. Uh, the, the, the films that I've gotten to score have been smaller films, and so consequently smaller budgets in terms of using orchestras and so forth. And, and you have to, to work just so much harder. I mean, the great thing with an orchestra is you write middle C for everybody and you go like this, downbeat, and it's amazing. And, yeah. and, and you know, it's like, hey, I'm a genius, you know. And uh, with electronic production, you really have to work a lot harder to get it to sound that good. When you do, you mentioned before when you're doing Cold Case and how as you got towards the end of the season, you'd have less and less time. Now, when you're talking about the time to do it, I think you said it was two weeks. Is that composition and actual recording? Is that is that yeah. anything? I, the, the nature of that show was that uh, the it was electronically composed with overdubs. So I would kind of do it as I went along, um, and I typically had a few soloists I would bring in. Um, sometimes I would bring them in at the point before the clients heard it, before the, the, the showrunner heard it because it was so essential to it. Sometimes I would use samples and say, okay, there's something like this is going to be there. It depended on how brave I was and how much I trusted their judgment on it. But there were certain people, um, uh, Chris Blath, for example, wonderful wind player, um, did a lot of work for me. Um, uh, he was my go-to soloist and he played a lot of Duduk, which is, you know, an Armenian instrument that really has nothing whatsoever to do in terms of history with Cold Case, which took place in Philadelphia. But it was very evocative and uh, emotional, which is what the show was really about. People often said Cold Case was a procedural show. That it was superficially, but actually that wasn't what the show was about. Um, yes, it was a cop show, and yes, there was a mystery, but that was it was always a cheesy mystery. What the show was, a, <laughs> whoops, I didn't say that. Uh, uh, what the show was really about was about the tragedy of losing somebody to murder, which is usually what happened. It was the it was the you would start out with by witnessing this murder, and by the end of the show, you would know why this was a great loss. And I thought it was a really brilliant format, and and my. Uh, hats off to Meredith Steen, who created the show. And there really has not been a show quite like that. It's usually focused on, you know, the cops and them unraveling. It's sort of the opposite, uh, unraveling the mystery. It's sort of the opposite of um, uh, CSI, where it's all about the forensic, oh, isn't this a very interesting problem? And you, you're emotionally very removed from the victim. Uh, whereas cold case was just the opposite. The actual procedure and all that was usually fairly straightforward, but your emotional investment in the, the, uh, victim was, um, very 
uh, intense by the end of the show. And so by the end, it's like, oh, no, um, which is why the duduk was actually such a fabulous instrument. Um, and, and I use my violin and I have an instrument called a chiola, which is an octave viola. It's the same register as a cello, but I can play it because it gets under my chin. <laughs> well, did you realize that? Right from the beginning, when you read the script, did did you get what the premise was, or did it take a while to sink in? Um, I n- understood it well enough by the second or third episode. I really was... Um, for one thing, the pilot was a little different from the rest of the show. And it had already been scored by um, Tom and Andy, who were, interestingly enough, also advertising people um, who had switched over. And they were friends with Mark Pellington, who had directed the episode. And they took a very detached kind of, I was, you know, they do beautiful sort of sound design work, but it wasn't very emotionally involving. That wasn't the intent. And uh, that's why Jerry hated it. And Jerry Bruckheimer hated it because he understood that the essence of the show was this emotional involvement. And so I, in some ways, was misled by the temp and didn't really quite get my footing on that show till the first or second episode after that. I do remember an interesting story, um, which was actually it was the very next episode. The first episode, they were not uh, they were still finding their way, but the, the, the pilot. But the, the very next episode, I remember um, Jonathan Littman, who was the head of of uh, Brookheimer Television telling me, trying to describe what he wanted for the murder scene. Now, I have to take a moment here and tell you, a year before this, I had been uh, asked by Harry Gregson Williams. Remember I mentioned Irish fiddle playing? Yeah. He, he had found out, I would mentioned it in a conversation with him that I played Irish fiddle. And he called me up and he says, do you really play Irish fiddle? And I said, yeah. He says, can you put together an Irish band? And I said, Yeah. And he was in a situation where they were recording in the UK. He couldn't use his regular people because it was going to be a, 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 you know, a, a dark date here. And he needed to do um, have an Irish band because um, he needed to do pre-records. And so I put together a band of, I said, sure, I can put together a band. I knew no one, but I had a really good band by the next day. And they're all, I'm all quite proud of them. And um, it all went very well. And then there was an epi- There was a, a scene, which was the murder scene in the movie, and uh, Harry had written it three times, and Jerry kept hating it. And he said, "Do you want to take a crack at it?" So I did, and Jerry liked it. So it went in the movie. So the, then the movie was shelved for reasons that I don't understand. Um, so a year later, here I am with Jonathan Littman, and. You know, probably he's wondering why they entrusted this show to someone who knew so little. And he says, um, there is this movie of Jerry's that nobody's seen yet. I wish you'd seen because there's this great piece of music in it that'd be perfect for this. I said, what's the movie? He said, well, no, no, you you haven't seen it. No one's seen it yet. And I said, well, what's it called? He says, Veronica Guerin. And I said, oh, what's the scene? He says, it's the murder scene. And he looks at me like, what, why do you know this? And I said, I think I can do something like that. Wow. Talk about so, a lucky break. Wow. So that, that and after, I, I think I was in with Jonathan. No kidding. Wow. But it just goes to show you there's a certain serendipity that goes with what we all do, where if you prepare for something like that, you know, who knows what will happen? Well, you know, I, I always feel that people who say that there is no luck, it's all your... In, intent and so forth are people who really have been so incredibly lucky that they don't see it. Um, but conversely, people who say, oh, it's all luck, you know, you did just, it just, it's all arbitrary, usually haven't done the work. And the you know, reality is some kind of weird confluence of luck and preparation. And that's um, the good news for people who are who who have done the preparation is that everybody gets lucky sometime. You don't know when it's going to be. You don't know how it's going to be, but it's going to happen sooner or later. Your number is going to come up. And if you're ready and if, you know, everything else is together, then, then that's when you get your shot. The whole thing is recognizing that when it comes, though, because a lot of people don't. 
And, and I know for a fact that I've given some work to people, and you probably have too, where you've handed something to someone and they just they didn't realize what was happening. Yeah, you, sometimes you want to just say, get this, don't blow this one. Yes. <laughs> but then, you know, I'm reluctant to do that because sometimes that's wrong. Sometimes it's like, you know, they'll go hit it out of the park and it doesn't mean anything, you know, <laughs> you, know? And right, you just right. never know. Well, the other thing, too, is there's a teaching moment there, too. So if you don't say anything, it's probably better because hopefully they'll understand at some point in time that, oh, yeah, okay, I can't let that happen again. You're One would hope. Sure. I'm, I'm, I'm way too much of a softie for that. If I, I'll tell them whatever I know. <laughs> yeah, probably better. Yeah. All right, last question. So you've been through a lot of different as- facets of the business. What have you learned about the music business or is there a piece of advice that someone has given you that has guided you or something that you've learned that kind of has guided you through the the business? I think the thing that, that in the area of film scoring and television scoring and games and commercials, um, and now notice I didn't include records, which is a slightly different area. But on the, in those, music's function is to be part of the story. The story is really what we're all telling. It's what the director, the writer, the cinematographer, the best boy, and the composer, everybody is t- helping to tell a story. And whatever you do, you have to put it in perspective of, is this helping or hurting the telling of the story? Now, you might be wrong, but, but that's the perspective you have to have. Not, is this a good or bad piece of music? No, or, oh, not, do I love this? But is it helping to tell the story? You know, just for those of you who are listening, Michael and I both spoke at USC at the, the, uh, the film school last week. And Michael told a, a, a lot of these great stories. But one of the things that you mentioned there was the fact that even in a 30-second commercial, you're basically telling the story and you're telling it in four acts or five acts. Three, usually. Three, three acts, okay. Yeah. So wh- whatever it is, you, you're, it has that same arc as it would in just about any story that you read or you know television a tv show or a movie or whatever but wow that's difficult to do in 30 seconds yeah well that's a part of the 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 craft of it is learning how to turn quickly and yet not make it sound like a mistake (laughs) not make it sound like you've just edited some things together but and and sometimes the turn can be very subtle uh, it can be a shift in harmony. It can be a shift in coloration. It can be a shift in rhythmic accompaniment. Um, if you listen to most pop hits, now getting back to the record side of it, they have a great deal of chapters and episodic uh, aspects to them. They, they, they are telling a story, too. It's just that the story is, in, is entirely musical, lyrical, as opposed to you know somebody up on a screen doing something else. So um, in, in that regard, it really is the same problem as well. It's, it's that no matter how great a, an, an individual element is, it has to make sense as part of developing the payoff of the whole, or it gets boring. Can you tell me the, the Lord story again? Okay. Um, well, uh, I got a call. Um, uh, my my producing partner, Lucas Cantor, and I were uh, working uh, with uh, Select Tracks, which is, has a business relationship with Universal, um, who has a business relationship with um, Lord's uh, album uh, record deal, which is on Republic Records. And um, this is, was at a point, this was July 4th weekend of 2013. So it was a point in which Lord had not yet hit. It's hard to believe, but almost no one in the United States knew who she was at that point. Um, And they wanted to do a cover of Everybody Wants to Rule the World, a very dark and intense cover because they were pitching it for a trailer for Noah, uh, the Aronofsky movie. 
Um, and so we got this assignment on a Friday night or whatever it was, the night before, July 4th, whatever it was that week, that year. And um, uh, we had to reconceptualize the whole thing, record our new idea, do some uh, – uh, do a reference vocal, send it to, to Ella, who was Ella Yelchin, who's Lord, who was in um, uh, New Zealand at the time, have her do her overdubs, get it back to us, get everybody to sign off on it and get it mixed and done by Monday morning. So we did that. Um, and it was a fairly intense and complicated process. And everyone was very happy. And absolutely nothing happened. Uh, it was the, they didn't want to use it for Noah and we thought it was dead, but then through a variety of, again, serendipitous things that are impossible to predict, it ended up becoming part of the hunger games, catching fire soundtrack. And from there took off. Uh, now this was a number of months later. And, uh, so there was this incredible, crazy dash to the finish line, then nothing and then, bit by bit, this thing began to catch on, and it's been used. I, I think my favorite trailer is uh, one you saw, actually, with the Assassin's Creed trailer. I thought they did a wonderful job adapting the, the song for the trailer, but it's been used in Dracula and Told and for all sorts of television shows, uh, How to Get Away with Murder and so forth. And the song has, uh, uh, according to Kurt Smith, who wrote the song originally, he likes our version better than his. So... Uh, that's a great compliment, and uh, it in turn opened up a number of doors. So um, I, I think that Ella, to tell you the truth, Lord is vaguely embarrassed by it because it's not really her sound. It's kind of a different. It's a you know, it's a very big and grandiose sound, and um, and she tends to do this kind of stripped down uh, electronica stuff, and so. Um, she has not pounded on our door asking us to do a, a, a sequel, but it has in turn led to a number of other things. It's still brilliant. It's a brilliant reconception. It's terrific. As a matter of fact, I'd like to uh, post that video on my blog if I can, because uh, everybody will love it. Uh, they'll, it's, you tell the story so well in that, but everybody get some exposure to it if they haven't heard it before. And definitely... Well, yeah, if you go to the YouTube page where I ex explain the story, there's also a uh, there are links to uh, at least one or two versions elsewhere. But I mean, if you type in "Everybody Wants to Rule the World," Lord, you'll find it. Yeah, Michael, thanks so much for your time today. This is great. I really enjoyed it. Likewise. To find out more about Michael, go to michaellevinemusic.com. That's all one word. Michael Levine, L-E-V-I-N-E, music.com. Thanks for listening and being my inner circle. Remember, if you have any questions or comments, do send them to questions at bobbyownercircle.com. Thank you very much, Steve Terabino. He's the host of the EDM Producer Podcast at edmmr.com. He helps put the show together. Thank you kindly. To listen to other episodes of Bobby Osinski's Inner Circle, go to bobbyosinski.com and select the podcast tab, or you can go to bobbyownercircle.com, or you can find it on iTunes or Stitcher. At bobbyosinski.com, you'll also find a sign-up form for my newsletter and for alerts for new podcasts. This is Bobby Osinski, and I'll see you next time. 